education as i was saying cannot be seen as independent it is integrated with the society it's integrated with a whole lot of things this is one clear example where healthy learning or healthy living or hygienic habits and hygienic living actually had a reverse pressure on ensuring targets are met physically good afternoon everyone thank you so much for joining us we have with us mr n v balachandran who is currently leading the sustainability agenda for ashok leland as their chief sustainability officer and president communication csr and corporate affairs he is a seasoned hr professional with over 30 years of corporate experience in leadership roles one of the most significant achievement is is the shaping of the road to school program a csr initiative of ashok leland in primary education in government schools as an alumnus of loyola institute bala is a proud recipient of the most distinguished alumni award in the year 2018 at the loyola global alumni meet welcome dear sir it's a pleasure to have you with us thank you so much for joining us so to begin with the questionnaire today uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey in the csr space thank you arushi uh well in terms of an introduction yes i am a hr professional with over 30 years of experience but i'd be more happy to introduce myself as someone who's been able to and be fortunate enough to be able to make a difference to the lives of school children in tamil nadu uh my education qualification is a masters in social work but having specialized in personal management i spent the initial years of my career in the field of hr and even in while in the field of hr Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be able to influence communities and societies by an inclusive model, where most of the recruitments that I have done, I've been able to do in communities which are under-resourced or probably under-serviced, and that has started my journey into this whole social work space or social impact space, and I've been able to carry that through my profession. Uh, somewhere about uh, close to seven years ago, when Ashok Leland decided to. structure their social impact initiatives through the csr program i was picked to jump in and volunteer to lead this initiative and while assessing what ashok leland has been doing over the last so many years they have been we've been in existence for almost 75 years now close to 74 years to be precise we've been doing a lot of work around environment around driver safety around road safety around uh, uh, environmental uh, protection issues uh, around education itself health initiatives we felt it was important that we structure all these initiatives into something very concrete and make a deep impact rather than a very cursory impact across a wide range of activities and that's when we engaged with uh, bcg consulting and we said let us have a very very uh, researched approach towards our initiatives and education did come up as one of the primary areas for focus and from there on we further zeroed the down to focusing on what form of education support that we could give and that's when after a lot of thought and then deliberations we said we will focus on primary education because we were able to make an impact in the primary education space it stands for good for life and that's when we conceive the road to school program and this program is specifically uh, looking at supporting the government schools in far reaching areas or you know far fledged areas where teacher shortage availability of quality resources um, accessibility Uh, as well as socio economic conditions of that are much below standards so that the impact that we make really reaches out to the most deserving and that's when we chose to go with this road to school program and here again uh, we very specifically zero down this program to focus on primary education for classes 1 to 8 and that we will focus only on government schools and that we will stick to the government regulations and framework and the syllabus so that we don't stray away from the mainstream so that is my journey into road to school it's been a very enriching journey we started with 36 schools and about 5400 children and today in the 8th year we are uh, 969 schools with about 96000 children and uh, this year we have taken a very ambitious target of doubling this number we will be adding another 96000 children to our fold That's amazing, sir. Thank you so much for sharing about this incredible journey uh, and the approach you've taken, which is a very systematic approach towards getting something accomplished in life, and especially when it comes to social impact. Uh, you know, my next question is about uh, the mission and vision of the programs at Ashok Leyland. We know that education is the best social leveler. 
can you substantiate the statement with reference to the vision and mission of the programs you have at Ashok Leyland? Okay. Uh, when we set about uh, focusing on learning outcomes, because that was the whole program about, you know, we wanted to look at how we can enhance the learning levels of the children in the government schools. Uh, we did, of course, we had a, a baseline testing and we realized that many of the government school children, especially in the areas that we've chosen to work, were far below the uh, learning average of the country. I mean, you have an ACES study which talks about what are the learning levels, and these are competency-based, uh, grade-based uh, um, uh, learning outcomes. So we said, let's focus on providing supplemental education. And we said, uh, we will have a, uh, an assessment done. And based on the assessment, we will develop modules which will um, you know, help us support the teacher, the existing uh, teacher, to work with children who have difficulty, who have challenges, to come up to speed and also, you know, thereby increase the national, I mean, the, the class average. But what we realized were there were a lot of uh, social economic challenges and problems that the child was facing, which was actually impacting his education. One, for example, uh, the children were coming from communities and from households where both the parents have not been educated. Uh, they've just not even gone to school. Second is both the parents earn and they are and they get to work pretty early in the morning. So the child is almost left alone and it is on her or his will and volition that he comes to school or she comes to school. Third is they are deeply malnourished and their only meal and probably the only reason they come to school is for the midday meal. So we realized that education is very, very intricately linked or connected with social issues. Also the fact is in many of these communities, Children going to school were not encouraged by some sections of the society. We have faced this in some of the regions where they felt that this was easy labor that they could latch upon. So come vacation time, these children would start to go and earn because it is convenient for the local landlords and the local uh, rich people to employ these people as poor farm labor. And also it was additional income for the parents. So no one minded these kind of challenges. So what we realized was unless and until we were able to address these social issues, we will not be able to resolve the problem of learning challenge. And also we realized that uh, unless and until these children are educated, got to school and taught some amount of self-confidence, self-respect and self-understanding or self-awareness, we will not be able to sustain this program over a, over a period of time. And that's when we coined this whole vision of uh, whether it's vision or a vision, whatever you want to call it. We, you know, coin this terminology that we will make an impact through education so that education becomes a social leveler. Because we wanted to use education to bring in self-respect, self-awareness and self-understanding of the child so that he or she is able to stand up to the society and make something about herself or himself. So that's when this whole concept of uh, so education as a social leveler came about. Also, it was important for us that the community starts to own this whole program because we, as an agency or as a company or as an NGO, can support. But if this has to sustain itself as a framework, as something that the society should take up, the community should own it. And for the community to own it, we need to ensure that the community believes in this one. So even from that perspective of sustainability, we felt that education should be treated as a social issue and as a social strength. And unless and until it is treated as a social strength, getting the child to be successful in school and getting the child to stay his entire course in school is not going to happen. And there you have. Thank you, sir. You very rightly said that uh, basically, you know, that education cannot be looked on as a standalone subject. It needs to have a comprehensive approach towards it because uh, at the end, all the social problems are linked together, you know, uh, for to ensure that children study well, you need to ensure their nutrition is in place, you need to make sure that they have proper wash facilities, you know, to remain healthy, you know, mentally and physically both. So that's a brilliant approach towards addressing this major challenge in the country. Um, in fact, support what uh, just said, and since you mentioned about washing and hygiene, one of the biggest asks at that point in time was to build toilets. It's you know, it was a time when uh, this whole uh, Clean India initiative came about. Right. And uh, there was a lot of talk around Swachh Bharat. So huge pressure from the society, huge pressure from the bureaucracy to build toilets. And we did a bit of study on that because 
uh, one of the strengths of our program is research based approach. It's not like if there is some need, we go ahead and satisfy. We do our research. And when we research, we found that many agencies have put up toilets, but unfortunately, the toilets are not connected to a sewage system. They do not have a water facility. They do not have any uh, uh, facility which will help it, you know, sustain itself over a period of time. There was no cleaning mechanism. There was no clearance mechanism. So all the toilets we could see actually close to 300, 400 toilets built kept unused. So what we realized was there is no point in building toilets, but create the need for a hygienic environment. So we worked a lot with the children, more importantly with the community, the society out there, more important with the panchayat body out there to ensure and teach children the value of hygiene, the value of washing hands before eating, the value of using a toilet, the challenges of open defecating. So once we were able to bring that value and bring that awareness in the children, we found that the demand for coming for toilets started to come from the society, started to come from the children, started to come from the parents. And we have at least in one village, which we work very, very intensely, where with the efforts of the children who refused to eat at home, 13 toilets were built in that particular village by the respective villages. So today, when we go about the villages, when we go about seeing that, we see that the children have actually influenced clean habits and thereby toilet, clean toilet habits have been able to be established in these villages. So again, education, as I was saying, cannot be seen as independent. It is integrated with the society. It's integrated with a whole lot of things. This is one clear example where healthy learning or healthy living or hygienic habits and hygienic living actually had a reverse pressure on ensuring toilets are fit physically. That's very right, sir, because uh, service delivery on its own will not yield you the impact that you want to see on ground uh, unless and until you make people aware first, you know, of what, why we are doing this and what is the impact that we are looking at. So uh, that's very, very important. Moving on to our next question, uh, you know, you've already shared with us and we are also aware of the impactful work being carried out by Ashok Leland in the space of education. We would like to understand, uh, you know, in detail about the Road to School program. Well, the Road to School program has uh, three or four dimensions. Of course, the primary dimension is learning outcomes, which means we have a baseline and an endline testing that happens every year for all children. And based on their scores, they are identified and placed in buckets. So what happens is we first assess the current strength of the child. And based on that, we have resource persons, as we call them, who have been uh, selected, recruited, and trained by us through our knowledge partner, which is Learning Links Foundation. And they are appointed one per school. So what their role is, based on the scores of the children, they work very closely with the principal to take out these children in groups, depending on their learning levels, and give them additional inputs or support initiatives, as we call them, or remedial. In the technical term is remedy, but we don't call it remedy because these are more support initiatives. So they ensure and work with the children. And the success of this whole program is the documentation and the assessment reports that we have for every child. So as we speak, we today employ close to 900 resource persons, which means that there is an extensive coverage. And uh, every school has got one resource person working very closely with the uh, principal. And uh, he or she ensures that the child is given additional inputs to the classroom sessions in terms of learning specifically on subject and grade-based learning. So learning enhancement is one critical part of the program. The second critical part is what we call as co-curricular activities. What we see is being in the classroom through and through makes it very difficult for the child. For the child. We felt that co-curricular activities like creating a science lab or creating a science kit or a math kit where learning is fun, you know, they, 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 they are clay activities, they are wood-based activities, they are uh, um, nature leaves, you know, they collect from the garden, then they play with those in terms of numbers and in terms of, so what happens is we started to create a lot of co-curricular activities, which are very established activities, you know, something, and there we pick out students who still find it very difficult to focus on the remedial classes to be able to come up to speed and learn in an environment which is interesting and fun for them. The third intervention that we have is extracurricular. 
is we sort of felt that sports is not something that has been given much attention especially in the town schools and that is when we partnered with another agency which is into sports where they look at sports more as a self awareness program or a self awareness activity so they teach uh, collaboration skills teamwork um, confidence competitive spirit interdependence through various activities so we bought a set of activities or they partnered with us in creating a set of activities where our resource persons were trained in terms of and it's not about competitive sports you know it's not about running it's not about high jump it's it's basically getting the children out to get into some form of activity and this one we found had significant impact on the children because the children suddenly felt that they could play have fun in school so starting with curriculum co curriculum and with extra curriculum we've been able to create a lot of interest and we suddenly realized after sports came in we were able to retain the children attendance improve and the whole sense of confidence and camaraderie started to improve in the schools in addition to this we also have the fourth uh, intervention which is on life skills basically we felt that if the children have to be independent in the society in the community that they are living they need to be taught about civic awareness they need to be taught about civic orientation and civic sense uh, and also more importantly they need to understand um, ways of life because they are also very uh, cocoon in that environment that they don't even know where the nearest police station lies they don't even know where the nearest post office is they don't even know what the post office does because these are very remote villages you should uh, imagine that uh, these sometimes there is not even a public transport which goes out there so we started exposing these children and uh, the resource persons were encouraged to take the children out on nature walks to take the children out to the nearest mandi when the mandi is operational take the children out to the post office and to the um um police station nearby basically exposing them as to what are the support mechanisms that are available for these societies to thrive so this we call life skills and this of course for a child which is from class 1 to 2 it's different uh, as you grow up you you know gradually take it up and when it comes to age standard we actually teach them what are the various careers that they can choose for the various career options the competitive examinations that they get into so this also you know gradually grows in terms of their age and age related Uh, career choices that they will have to make so these are the four key um, activities of the road to school program so the program sounds very holistic uh, in its approach to you know children's development and um, you know as well as the part that it's not just right to education which is important but right to play is equally important absolutely highlighting that in your uh, statement so next question uh, is basically are there any programs in place for children after they finish their education to equip them with needed skills for the marketplace oh interesting question and this is something that we started uh, since last year but we were not able to execute it in its entirety because of the pandemic we have something called the road to livelihood which is essentially focusing on children from class 8 to 12 because our program if you look at it from its intent is basically covering children from class 1 to class 8 So class eight onwards, we now have the eighth year running. So some of them who would have started with us have spent almost six, seven years with us, and uh, we find them a lot more confident than most other school children. And we felt that we need to probably support these children, and that's when we conceived this road to livelihood, which is nothing but focusing on some uh, fundamental, uh, basically, you know, getting them aware of the various competitive examinations, getting them exposed to take competitive examinations, uh, having a career. guidance and a career assessment done for them because many of the children are not aware that they can go and work in a garment factory for example they can go and work in an iti for example because for them everything is all about engineering or everything is all about uh, getting a degree not realizing that there is a huge scope in the vocational space and that's where we have been able to help them out and also we teach them conversational english we support them in special classes with physics and chemistry because that's always a challenging um, um subject we we in case there are no labs in the schools we you know equip the labs with uh, i mean equip the schools with labs and scientific testing equipment so that the children are exposed because you know in a, in a private school you have all these things sometimes you you have a challenge in these uh, uh, remote schools so what happens is this road to livelihood is something which is aimed at preparing the children to face life preparing the children to integrate with society because there are going to be no employment opportunities in their respective areas so we actually also started an entrepreneurship program where they could either get into agriculture they could get into uh, agri trading they could get into self employment in terms of the dairy they could get into self employment especially for women in the garment industry so we are also looking at alternate careers for them which either to have not 
been exposed um, to them. So this Road to Livelihood program is essentially getting them prepared for a life in uh, perpetuity, especially in this competitive world. And one clear example that we can share with you is 76 of the children from the RK schools, especially from the Hosur Belt, are now being trained in Ashok Leyland Basic Training Center, where after a two-year program, uh, they get a diploma which would make them eligible for a job either in Ashok Leyland or in any of the factories in and around that region or any other region. We have we are um, happy that we have made them employable and we have given them something that they could hold on for life. Very true, sir. I mean, like uh, livelihoods, uh, livelihood opportunities for people from the marginalized communities is always the only way uh, out of the poverty cycle that they have been trapped for generations, you know, because Absolutely. importance of education, health, wash, you know, having the opportunity to be able to work and provide for their families is a huge help to all of them. Uh, you've been, you are doing amazing work there. You already mentioned before that, you know, because of the COVID-19, you could not launch the program in its entirety. Now, uh, we all know that COVID-19 has adversely affected the education of children. What challenges did you face and how did you overcome these challenges? Well, when uh, most schools shifted to online teaching, our first reaction was to do the same. But uh, we realized that uh, in many of the households, there was no tablet or a smartphone. And more importantly, there was no network coverage. So while we felt that, or when we again assessed and uh, took a study, 55% of the households had uh, a smartphone or a device where we could reach out. But the challenge was network. Uh, and that was something that we could do nothing about. So what we said was, we will figure out a way where there is some form of uh, physical interaction. Uh, and that's when, during the peak of the pandemic two years ago in August, we printed almost 55,000 worksheets, which are uh, in line with the syllabus, but ensures that learning is sustained. Because we couldn't, I mean, we, we had to you know play the uh, uh, line very, very carefully. So we printed almost 55,000 worksheets and ensured that they are delivered in the peak of the pandemic to the school so that the paper pencil connect is maintained. So we were probably the only agency which was working in the pandemic, during the pandemic, where our resource persons, because they're mostly locals, uh, ensured that they travel short distances. We got them permission from the various authorities to go. And the children practicing safe distancing were called to a community center or were called to a local uh, household where in batches of five, six, these paper instruments were administered to them. So when we did a study, which was in January, and when we compared this with the ACER studies, we found that the children who were engaged during the pandemic through this paper pencil exercise, as well as through a mix of hybrid learning through the uh, uh, resource person, as well as through online, we were able to arrest the learning loss significantly better than schools which did not engage in any form of uh, learning with the children. So even during the pandemic, we ensured that there is a connect with the RPs. Even the school principals were not able to travel, but our RPs ensured that they were there and engaged with the children. And here I should, I should acknowledge the support given by the society, by the respective communities. And we frankly did not have a challenge in any of the community because for them, children learning and schools Schooling was very, very important. And with the support of the community, many of the community, the panchayats or the school management committee, as you call it, were supportive. In fact, they made the RPs very comfortable in their respective villages. They even provided accommodation in some cases for the villages, I mean, the villages for them to stay on during that period because they couldn't travel. And uh, there was a lot of uh, social support that we received to ensure that the learning uh, continued. And of course, we have a lot of success stories to talk about where children would uh, actually trouble the RP saying that can we start, start the classes at uh, 5.30 or 6 in the morning because 7.30 my father will take the phone and go away. So we had in some cases RPs actually you know, starting classes by 5.30, 6 in the morning. So at least one hour, one and a half hours of learning that the child would actually uh, get through. And we also uh, in, in, in smaller pockets had uh, uh, drives where we could, uh, some could loan or some could donate their old smartphones and almost 60, 70 smartphones were distributed to the children uh, wherever there was no, uh, you know, connect, I mean, wherever the households did not have a uh, smartphone. So a lot happened during the COVID and our 
only and the single focus was to ensure that there is no learning loss we do not focus on learning enhancement at that point in time but arrest learning loss because when you don't come to school you lose that connect that's really inspiring uh, inspiring sir and in fact a brilliant approach that you adopted uh, you know thinking of not at least letting the learning stop while you know uh, in any case when you were not able to do the learning enhancement part of the uh, program you know you in directly highlighted the part that the partnerships form a very important uh, you know part of the entire social impact that impact work that we do <clears throat> now what is your approach to partnerships for strengthening and amplifying the work that that you have been doing well um, first two to three years we were grappling ourselves we were learning we were trying to understand we were trying to come to terms with some of the challenges after which we realized two things one our program started to show results our programs started to impact communities and societies word spread around and there was a lot of initial uh, uh, support or a lot of initial uh, partnership options that were actually thrown at us we were a little shy let me be honest we were very shy we were not too sure whether we should go in with this or not but we realized as we matured that unless and until we partner with local agencies partner with other firms partner with other uh, communities and partner with other knowledge uh, bodies we were not going to expand we were not able to scale up so partnership now is fundamental to our existence as we speak we probably are one of the very few companies corporates engaged in education which partners with other corporates and actually get them to either fund or part fund our program so we are working with jsw <clears throat> actually in our health program we are working with um, tbs and with titan for some support in the local areas we are working with uh, a lot of knowledge bodies like for example learning links foundation is our knowledge partner we have edu sports which partnered with us in uh, sports <clears throat> we have uh, rapsody which is partnering with us in music art and culture we are now in talks with our own fellow group companies to fund our program we are talking with uh, apollo we are talking with asta we are talking with multiple corporates as we speak to ensure that they also partner in with us and in many cases we have actually offered that <clears throat> we will run this program for you we are now kind of uh, turning the tables and saying that we have the knowledge we have the experience we have the resources if you want this is the impact we've been able to create if you want to create this impact in your region we will actually run the program for you so partnerships are the key to success we have realized it we have experienced it and we now wish to enhance it brilliant sir brilliant because um, i mean like at the end of the day you have to work together to be able to really see the impact that you want to see on ground um you know uh, coming to our last question for the day uh, what is the big shift in the domain of education that we need to look for and prepare our children around well a uh, very very simple answer to a very complex question we need to get our children ready to face the world today our education system has got certain very strong fundamentals but the last mile reach in the connectivity is still wanting so that has to be strengthened and while strengthening that we will have to ensure that the long term uh benefit or the long term impact of education is realized by getting the children prepared to face the world both from a career perspective from a self respect and self awareness perspective and also from a social perspective thank you so much sir for sharing these insightful uh, pointers with us and you know sharing your thoughts and your opinion about some of the very important aspects in life uh, it was wonderful to have you with us we really enjoyed the discussion and we wish you all the very best and you know to your team as well who's doing this amazing work uh, we wish you all the best thank you very much thank you and great to have participated in this discussion thank you